Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for another Microsoft Reactor live stream event. My name is Rebecca Karen and I'm the New York Reactor event planner. I'm happy to be welcoming Lisa Cohen, a principal data scientist manager from the Microsoft Cloud Data Science team back again with us. Um, if you missed any of her earlier sessions, they were recorded and I recommend definitely checking them out. A lot about business development and personal development um, and networking. So I'll share links to the YouTube uh, channel for you to be able to check those sessions out. Um, today, Lisa will be discussing tips for effective data science in the enterprise. This session will run for approximately 60 minutes. Lisa will answer some questions throughout, but most of the questions will be saved till the end. Do feel free though to drop those questions into the chat throughout her presentation just because we do with the live um, sessions have a little bit of a feed delay between speaker to audience. So we just want to make sure that at the end you're not sending questions and the sessions already ended because of that delay. Um, also to mention, this session will be recorded too and will be found in a few days up on our YouTube channel. If you have any comments, questions, again, just feel free to drop them into the Q&A. Uh, at the end of the session, I'll be sharing a link to a survey. We usually have asked for feedback on the specific session. Now we are trying to plan for upcoming and future sessions, so the survey I'll be sharing will be a little bit more interactive where you can actually provide some feedback of what you'd like to see for future content. Um, at this time, I will pass the floor and the mic over to Lisa. Thank you again for joining us and for doing this session, Lisa. We really appreciate and look forward to them. Excellent. Well, thanks for the introduction, Rebecca, and uh, really happy to be here with you all today on this topic. Um, so as Rebecca mentioned, as we go, you know, feel free to add any questions as they arise in the chat and I'll address them if they're kind of relevant to move forward for the topic and if not, we'll will come together on all of those here at the end. Great, so as, um, as Rebecca mentioned, my name is Lisa Cohen. Um, I'm a data science manager in Microsoft Cloud Data Sciences, and I'll share just a, a brief intro um, oops, as we get going here to give a sense of, um, you know, my experience that I'm gonna be drawing from for the session. Uh, but overall, the, the way I've, structure the format of the session is for one to talk about data science career path so um, essentially the you know the the goal of this session is that there's a number of great data science programs out there and so what i wanted to focus on was you know then as you enter the enterprise um, in a data science role what are some of the scenarios considerations and trade-offs to consider in that environment um, beyond some of the you know the topics that um, you get exposed to in the academic environment. So touch on career paths and then go through the life cycle of a data science project um, and a number of considerations along the way and then finally reflect on some of those real world um, considerations that arise. So just briefly about my experience, I come from a um, quantitative background academically studying applied math. I joined Microsoft 17 years ago working on Visual Studio, so that was a good experience to learn about software development processes um, through developing tools for developers as well um, that gave a lot of great context for the rest of my career here at Microsoft. I had a number of roles in that group, um, but ultimately as big data was growing and we were increasingly looking at that quantitative feedback um, through our telemetry. That was an area I focused on for our Visual Studio users through product and business analytics, and then moved into a data science org um, as part of Azure, where um, I currently lead a cross-functional team across a number of the roles that we're gonna be discussing for, for career paths here. Uh, we look at the end-to-end -end Azure business by bringing together a set of um, a broad set of data sets um, actually extending on Azure and the broader Microsoft Cloud um, with the ultimate charter to help customers be successful. Um, I'm also very um, passionate about communities, um, whether it's things like the Reactor here um, or other groups for mentorship, managers, book clubs, etc. 
Um, and I enjoy engaging in the industry um, as a board member um, through blogging or speaking event, at events like these. Um, so I'll draw from my experience at Microsoft, but then also through you know discussions that I've had with colleagues um, at other companies as well. And the other bit I thought I would just share um, by way of intro that's perhaps relevant to the topic of this discussion is you know what are some of the goals that I use for our data science organization um, as as part of you know what I see for a mature data science org. Um, I think there's obviously an aspect around leveraging world class techniques and industry best practices um, for the data science practices and then the, the kind of engineering best practices for how how you go about those. Um, I think there's also an aspect of you know really getting the business so it's not an academic separate um, kind of isolated org it's very applied um, to be able to unlock the power of data science in the enterprise so that involves being able to provide relevant and specific recommendations to the business um, and ultimately really being a, a strategic partner as opposed to just kind of a service that's serving up data points that are requested. Um, really, we'll talk about how to really think about what the business needs. Um, and curiosity, I think, is a great aspect in this, is a great approach in this role, you know, being able to think innovatively about, you know, various directions we can go and the ways that we can apply these amazing data science tools. There is a, a great trend in the industry around digital transformation, and I think data is a key asset. And so being able to really unlock the power of data for your organization um, is a is a really strategic role to be in. Um, and then through being that collaborative business partner, um, also having organized processes to prioritize and plan our work, um, communicate expectations, provide objective analysis so that we can really let the data lead our conclusions. And then also ultimately building a you know a great place to work um, with a diverse, inclusive environment, a, a strong cult collaborative culture, um, and a, an environment for learning and growing, which kind of brings us back to the first topic around you know leveraging those world class practices that comes from being able to learn different approaches and bring those to the group. So with that context, um, we'll go ahead into the the main agenda for the session, starting with the various roles and career paths. And I've used a few different terms here for different roles because there are a variety in the industry. So I've tried to map that here, but I will also mention you know, what we use within, within our team at Microsoft as well. So within the data scientist role, this is often going to be covering analytics and inference, such as statistical analysis, experiments. Um, there is some machine learning definitely for um, for insights, um, but then I think the you know for a majority of the workload to be in production machine learning, that's typically under a machine learning scientist role or sometimes called a research scientist. There is also another variant such as uh, called a machine learning engineer that is typically with more of a software engineering background, um, you know, implementing those AI services in production. Um, so I think two related roles there. Um, and within our group, we have the machine learning scientist role, which maps to research scientists as well, um, developing those predictive, prescriptive models um, that are running in production using machine ML ops. Um, then we also have the data engineer role. And so this is the part of the team that's developing our, our data platform and pipelines, a really critical asset for the whole organization and developing that in a way that's um, compliant, reliable, um, that you know incorporates those broad data sets and also helps run those those models in production and then finally the pm role um you know which you'll hear in the industry is a number a few different um there's variations on pm there's project management program management product management um so you know the technical product management is helping um manage and implement the data science process um, product management is getting deeper into really understanding the um, the user needs and helping you know helping innovate on what are the particular data science solutions that we can provide where those users can be both kind of internal to the organization if you have internal customers leveraging um, your data science products um, as they call it or or external customers as well as you're shipping these as live services as part of the product 
And so I think there's you know a number of great ways to be involved in data science in the enterprise um, through these roles. And so just thinking about which of those aspects that I mentioned sounds most exciting is a, a great way to kick off. Um, I also tend to think within the the data scientists and machine learning scientists domain um, about this Venn diagram. There's actually a number of different Venn diagrams for the data scientist skill set. Um, you can search online for, for Conway's Venn diagram and you'll find a number of variants that grew from that as well. Um, but I find that this is a helpful framing both to think about you know, the skill sets to develop if you want to get into data science, uh, for, you know, as you're going to interview for roles as well, as well as like as a current data scientist in role, you know, developing a learning and growth plan. These are a few different buckets that that are helpful to reflect on from time to time and and explore, you know, what are the skills that you want to learn and grow next and um, what are the specific trainings or on the job experiences or mentorship um, to get there. And so um, I would say that you can see that the the buckets have, you know, perhaps it's not exactly drawn to scale with the three spheres there. There's longer, shorter lists, but you could also debate like the relative importance of every two areas. But anyway, um, you know, the technical area, I think, is a lot of the traditional areas that are going to come from a data science program. Um, learning about the statistics, the, um, the querying languages, the machine learning model algorithms and techniques. Um, and, you know, I also put like analytical problem solving, just being able to really frame the problem in the appropriate way. Um, data visualization um, gets involved in this category as well. And then the next bucket domain, um, you know, in this case in the enterprise, it's often the, the specific business context or domain, but, you know, it could be any even academic domain as well that you're applying the data science to. And this is, you know, understanding that data set, understanding how the business operates because, you know, without that context, the data and the numbers can be interpreted in a number of different ways and actually can be misinterpreted too if um, we don't understand what the fields actually mean or how the business process is actually working that we're modeling. So that's a really um, essential um, aspect to learn and grow as well, um, whether that's through, you know, talking to the business partners, trying out the product yourself or ex and or um, and perhaps um, exploring the data sets to see what they show. And then finally, um, you know, it's often referred to as like the softer skills um, are or interpersonal skills, um, things around communication. Uh, we'll discuss the role that that plays at the stages of the data science project. Um, being able to organize the various demands coming in um, and prioritize, um, collaborating. I find a lot of times, you know, the the domains, you know, as you, there's the broader domain for the entire organization, but then that gets divided between data scientists who become, you know, spe subject matter experts or owners for particular areas. So there's often cross group scenarios that come into play as we're looking at things that span across, um, which brings up teamwork as well. So another aspect to consider then is what type of organiz organizational environment you want to be in. And there are a number of different ways that data science is organized. Um, sometimes you'll find an embedded approach where data scientists are interspersed throughout the business. Um, and that that's helpful for being able to have that business context and short time to market for insights to, to go back to business actions. Um, on the other hand, there's also a centralized approach where you bring all the data science to get scientists together in a central reporting chain so that creates um, really helpful career paths and mentorship and just you know having a set of like minded peers who are all in the same craft who you can learn from and share ideas with. Um, but then it requires extra calories on you know staying close, to, making sure that you're staying close to the business and um, you know creating infrastructure processes or rhythms to to ensure that you have that context as well so i think either can be helpful i think in the embedded model i recommend to find a data science community or mentorship um, in the centralized model finding a good way to to stay connected with your stakeholders and in in our group we're actually in a bit of a hybrid in between we are a centralized data scientist org um, but we do work in a hub and spoke model where there are um, analysts or champs, I suppose, within the business teams who we work with who kind of run the running of the business of those parts of the orgs as well. 
And maybe another aspect I'll just mention as you're starting off and designing what type of environment you want to be in, in a, as a data scientist environment um, as a data scientist is that I think there's also a decision between you know the size of the company that you're joining perhaps and whether you're the first data scientist whether you're going to be one of a few or you know or part of a larger team and I think those also have a number of trade-offs so for example you might uh, want to go to a larger data scientist data science org in order to learn and grow from others there and uh, be able to specialize and really become a subject matter expert in specific space. Um, on the other hand, I think the advantage of, you know, a smaller organization means that you might be wearing multiple hats. Maybe there won't be the four different roles that I mentioned. Maybe you'll actually be wearing um, all of those or, you know, multiple of those, for example. And so I think just depending on where you are in your career, you might um, um, see the pros and cons of each of those differently. So now let's get into the different phases of a data science project. And uh, we do have on the Microsoft documentation site, the team data science process. I've included the full link there, but you can also just search for that term and that will come up. And so this goes into um, the various stages of a machine learning model. For the purposes of this talk, um, I'm gonna actually use a more generalized flow here, which applies to uh, three different data science products, if you will, um, analysis, experiments, and models. And so um, just to kind of cover all of those different types of data science projects you might be involved in, this is a kind of a generalized flow. So in any of those three cases, um, you start with the project kickoff, which might be a hypothesis that you want to explore or a problem that the, the business has raised. And so we've really started adapting a, a the planning process that you'll see in broader engineering constructs and organizations. And so that's been helpful to apply to data science as well and really helps us focus on the, the biggest rocks, if you will, because there's there's really an infinite number of data science questions um, or opportunities we could explore. And so this helps uh, prioritize those and, and the way we prioritize and also really just internalize what, what success looks like for the project is by asking a few of these questions that um, we put in a project intake form, which is brief, um, but just offers um, some very useful reflection as we're kicking off the project. So asking questions like, what new capability will this enable? What decision or action will we take as a result? And what's the expected business impact? You know, what are, what are the objectives and key results that we can measure as a result of, you know, if we if we are successful in this pursuit? And so that really helps separate the questions from curiosities to, um, you know, the, the more impactful um, opportunities. And so this has been a helpful framework um, for us to explore. And so then moving on, um, once we commit the project and we understand what the goals are, I also find it's helpful to, to take a moment to step back and reflect on the overall approach. Um, you know, sometimes we might be tempted to just dive right in, um, especially if it's an accelerated project deadline. But I find, again, this is another point where the initial reflection um, can be really valuable because it can help us brainstorm different paths that we could take here and um, helps ensure that we end up with the, the best outcome. So the next, um, and, and then we get to the point where you do dive into the data. Um, and so a few things to consider for, for this phase. Uh, this, is, this is also a, um, an important stage where we explore the data set um, and sometimes, you know, just getting a sense of the distributions, the ranges, the completeness of the data for the data quality um, can be a, a key stage before making later conclusions. So depending on the, the data quality that we see, there might be some actions that we take to, um, you know, to improve that before we get started. Um, as we understand the data distribution, that really helps us understand better how the business is actually operating um, and also impacts what statistical tests we might apply later um, and modeling techniques as well. So that's really helpful context um, throughout this exploratory data analysis that we use in the earlier project kickoff phases. Um, and of course, if you're, you know, if you're a subject matter expert in a particular domain, you know, you'll you'll really 
grow this expertise in the data set over time. So that's one of the benefits of, you know, having that alignment with a particular area, both to get to the data set, the business, the stakeholders, etc. Um, and then, yeah, just keeping your eyes open as you go through this part of the process. There is, this is often where some of the surprises occur, where we find interesting insights. We didn't know that the product was being used in a particular way, for example, um, and can yield some pretty interesting insights. And then finally, yeah, I mentioned applying your sniff test. So, you know, always be thinking about like, what are the what are the numbers for this part of the business and the insight that I'm finding here? Does this make sense? You know, what is the the gravity, the conclusion? If um, you know, if we see some kind of extreme surprises there, um, so you know, keep that in mind as well as you're exploring the the data quality, for example, and understanding you know whether some of these insights are more of a um, you know, a factor of the just the data that you're dealing with um, and the quality there or actually a business insight. This is where some of the engineering standards that I mentioned come into play as well, really throughout the process. Um, but, you know, just some of these that you encounter in software development really apply in data science as well, um, such as things like source control. Uh, we've really been able to leverage notebooks as a way to make our analysis refreshable um, as written in Python or R, and we can just kind of refresh these scripts. Um, leveraging a data dictionary has been a helpful way to have a, a common view across both the, our data science organization as well as our business stakeholders on what is the meaning of each of these terms um, and fields. Um, data contracts and service level agreements, that's been helpful when we have a production model, for example, to have those upstream contracts with the, the data set owners. We don't always own the data set. Sometimes it's something that's emitted as part of a business process, for example. And so if we're going to depend on it for a production output, you know, of course, if there's a change upstream from us that is you know, potentially out of our control. And so having that contract helps create um, awareness for that owner that we are depending on them in that way. And then the service level agreement tells us, you know, if there is a, an outage, what is our um, timeline for responsiveness and um, dealing with some type of a live site, for example. Um, privacy, compliance, and ethics. I mentioned um, a few of these when I was talking about the data platform goals and designs, but these are, you know, principles that also um, are key considerations at each at each stage in the stack. Um, and then, yeah, other practices also leverage from, you know, from software engineering best practices, doing things like peer and code reviews. Um, we've leveraged office hours and brown bags. It's a great way in the in that broader data science organization to bring together the data scientists and come up with best practices for how the whole organization goes about tackling certain types of problems. And so that's a nice way to share techniques. But of course, you know, it's done in an open way so that if someone researches a new approach, you know, that can always be incorporated as the, the best path going forward, just applying that growth mindset and knowing that we can, you know, always always look for new um, tools out there. And sometimes it's a, a gradated approach as well, right? There might be, you know, depending on different types of analysis in this general domain, we might take um, different approaches too. Um, but at least, you know, leveraging some kind of framework to, to make those decisions. Um, and yeah, I think also the retrospective process has been really valuable. Um, also leverage from, you know, general engineering Approaches, so being able to kind of reflect back on um, on a period, what went well, what didn't go well, what didn't go as well, um, you know, what are ideas for next time, and then we'll discuss um, in the coming section about the sharing sharing our work. And so, just a few of these reflections as we're going through the process on, you know, what are some of the considerations that arise um, in in these business scenarios. One is the reminder around causation versus correlation. You know, a lot of analyses will initially show a correlation, um, um, similarly with, with modeling approaches or regression analyses. And, you know, so just being conscious when we share those with the business that, you know, that we don't want to mislead any users about the conclusions that we can make from that. So just recalling that those are um, correlations versus causation. If we do ultimately want to be able to prove causation, we'll run a randomized controlled trial um, and through experimentation, 
be in a position where we can actually um, declare that it is causal um, to a particular confidence interval. And so um, that's been an approach there, as well as causal inference techniques has been another approach that we've adopted and has been, you know, fairly widely used in the industry too, um, where there are some scenarios where we might not be able to actually, you know, not provide this benefit to a certain subset of our users that would, you know, cause other kind of fairness considerations. And so in that case, we end up creating a bit of a constructed control through um, causal inference techniques um, to, to be able to provide similar conclusions. So other experiment considerations that come into play, um, one is time to market. I think there, you know, I mentioned in the next one that, um, well, the done is better than perfect. There's also the you know, perfect is the enemy of good. There are some cases where, you know, we, we also need to consider that, um, you know, that the perfect approach, which might take months might not be as valuable to the business because by that point the business has changed or the comp competition and landscape and market have evolved. So um, those are all factors to consider in the, the design. Um, so that's where I mentioned the opportunity cost. Um, sometimes what we'll do in these cases is we'll develop more of like a short term solution in parallel with the longer term solution. And so that can give us some insights along the way that help the business directionally um, while we still are developing, you know, a a more um, sophisticated approach and then we can just continue to evolve our thinking as that goes live as well. Um, yeah, and then I mentioned the 80-20 the rule. So this is, you know, often 80% of the insights can be derived from 20% of the, the data or the analysis. So that that occurs too. Um, model explainability is another consideration. So sometimes, you know, actually the model that can be best understood by the users in production, might be preferred over a model that might even have slightly better performance, but is a little bit more of a black box. So if we're gonna ask, you know, a, a account manager to, you know, follow certain recommended actions, if they can understand why that recommendation is there or you know why we think this is the next best action to take with the customer or why we think this customer is at risk of churn um, that can often be more actionable than um, you know perhaps a score that's slightly more um, you know a model that has slightly better performance but again they don't have that context to be able to help guide their actions and also have confidence in the model so so that definitely comes into play um, another approach that we'll sometimes use here is providing the business with some analytic solutions as um, you know it's always a great foundation to have that analysis in the space as we're developing the model in parallel as well um, to you know, just to understand the overall domain as we discussed earlier. And sometimes it actually helps the business in moving to a data-driven approach for that space to, you know, start with the analysis and um, get used to relying on that before and then trusting the, the model and being able to um, evolve the processes in that way. Skewed populations are another scenario that I wanted to mention here. I think that's very common across a number of businesses where, um, it comes up in a number of scenarios, which is, for example, you know, you often have a, a smaller set of users who are, you know, the most engaged and then perhaps a, a longer tail that follows from that. And then, you know, we've referenced a variety of times just the data quality, uh, monitoring, things like anomaly detection and the investment in proving data sets. I think often there's a lot of focus on model tuning and performance, um, but what I found just through our own work is that sometimes, you know, that that data platform investment and helping um, improve the data sets can actually end up having um, a, a really substantial impact in the ultimate results of the insights that are derived on top of it. And so um, that's a great place to invest as well. So now getting to this um, final stage around deployment and socialization, um, feedback loops that occur here as well. Uh, wanted to just underscore the importance of this stage. Uh, we often, you know, we, we've developed a publishing platform that we use to share the results of our analysis and that really helps from being able to take these individual insights and really tie together an overall story that's a lot more useful for the business. Um, and so, you know, being able to write those out is is very useful. Um, 
creates more of a narrative sometimes than the slides. Um, other approaches that we take there are, you know, being very specific on the takeaways um, and concise in that way with the, the business so that they can get a clear view of the action plan and recommendations. And then in terms of connecting with the audience, you know, being able to, to do that mapping or translation from the data science um, terms to more of the business terms and scenarios and really putting it in your audience's language, um, whatever their context is. Um, and then various, um, you know, presentation tips that can be helpful here as well. And so on those, along those lines, um, I thought we could take a moment just to to talk about data visualization as well as a helpful tool for being able to land the data in a concise way that um, is easiest for the audience to consume um, and reflect on. So, you know, there are pros and cons for a number of these approaches. So it's, you know, it can be situational based on what you're trying to communicate. But, you know, a couple of considerations for the charts on the left and the right here. Um, on the left one, the title is um, beyond describing, you know, what you see in the chart. It's actually providing a conclusion or statement insight. Um, it's, you know, here we have two retention curves from a, a treatment and control where you start with 100% of the population at birth, um, you know, at the, the first date. And then, you know, over time, you see the amount of the population that is retained um, at each month over month here. And so, you know, the, the key takeaway in this case was that the treatment had significantly higher retention over the control. And so the chart on the left is also, you know, just pointing out that 26 point difference. Um, you can see that there's a scaling difference on the Y axis from the two. It's generally um, a best practice to start the scale from zero because I think on the right, it might overemphasize the difference um, just because of the, the Y axis starting at a higher number. Um, and then, yeah, I think one thing that would be situational is, you know, some of those data labels that are there on the left. Um, if that's going to be part of your talking points, um, it does emphasize the different population sizes between the two lines, um, which can be useful for, you know, conveying, you know, what was occurring here. Um, but for simplicity, you might just choose a subset of those um, to simplify the message and focus the audience as well. And so along the lines of focus, yeah, another Another helpful tool there is around color. So if you have an, a set of series here, I guess um, groups we've called them, um, you know, here rather than using the multiple colors, if you're going to just hone in on one for your key takeaway, um, color can be a powerful tool to really focus the audience and, um, and make the message pop. And so I think the whole idea through these data visualizations is to make your visuals work for you and not against you. I think I've often found that, you know, we can get into a meeting and if the slide is too complex, you're you're almost kind of fighting with it as you're presenting. And so as much as um, we can just think about the story that we want to tell and the key points, one, two, three, that we want to hit to construct that and then just providing the simplest supporting um, assets to help with that um, can be an effective approach. And so that was just a bit of a touch of the iceberg on data visualization. Um, here is one of the authors that that we've um, really subscribed to, which is Cole's work. Um, so you can find her book, and these are a number, and there are libraries that you can leverage um, as well. And so these are a few um, visuals that have been helpful for us in order to communicate insights and approaches. And so wrapping it up, um, you know, is it, thinking about careers in um, in data science and enterprise um, was offering a bit of a progression here. Um, one, starting off with becoming a subject matter expert in a particular area, delivering results. Um, we discussed, you know, a number of different roles that are available in the industry. Um, we talked about different stages of the data science process um, for a project, whether that's analysis, an experiment, or a model. Um, and then we also discussed a number of, you know, real world considerations that come into play along the way. So, um, you know, starting off being able to deliver results um, through leveraging those approaches as 
consider increasing your impact. Um, this is where we get into some of like the data science maturity topics that I mentioned as we kicked off. So really being able to reflect given that context that you have about the business through the data, which is you know, such a powerful perspective on what's occurring, you know, being able to then brainstorm, how can we fully leverage the power of data science in this space? And um, sometimes I like to talk about you know, developing not just what our users or stakeholders are asking for, but what they want and what they need. And so um, sometimes without, you know, the business owner, you know, regularly working with these data science tools, they might not know all of what we can bring to the problem. And so being able to just reflect on what the goals are, what they're trying to accomplish, what the business needs are, that can spark new ideas. Um, you know, perhaps they're asking for a specific data point, you know, what are the, um, the key factors that help my users get to this stage of a funnel or a journey, um, but perhaps there's a model that you could recommend, um, a propensity model or a recommendation model, um, a, a term prediction model that would yield those insights in a more efficient and comprehensive way. So that's just an example of where you can really be a strategic partner with your, um, with your business stakeholder in that way. Um, and then, you know, continuing to expand horizons, um, mentoring, networking, books, courses, um, data science events, um, just staying in touch across your company and the industry on the, the business side as well. Those are all ways to spark additional ideas in these spaces as well. And so with that, um, I'll share a few places to stay in touch. Uh, through LinkedIn, I'll post updates on various um, content that I'm developing. We've also developed a, a blog at, on Medium um, called Data Science at Microsoft, where you can find out more about specific techniques that we're applying. Um, and we'd love to hear comments based on your approaches as well. And then you can find my email here too. So with that, um, I'll turn it over for Q&A and see if there's any questions that folks have um, that they'd like to, to touch on at this time. OK, so I see one here. Um, is a data science model or algorithms would they change all the time and do they change very rapidly? Um, so uh, let me just try to make sure I'm understanding the question here and feel free to clarify further in the chat. So as far, I think one question was, you know, just are the algorithms out there continuing to evolve in the industry? Um, and I would say absolutely yes. There's, you know, probably the 80-20 the rule here applies. I think that there are a set of um, core techniques that can be, um, you know, can really help with um, the majority of, of problems out there today. Um, and so those will typically get, um, you know, are kind of classic and will continue to get applied over time. But yes, absolutely. Like we're, um, so, you know, regression modeling would be an example of that. But I think, yeah, we're, you know, the, the business, I think the, sorry, the field is continuing to evolve. And so things like neural nets are, you know, we're continuing to have new approaches and techniques um, that are continuing to be explored um, in like the deep learning scenario um, there. And so, yeah, I think that's an evolving field. I think like any area in tech, you know, I think that's one of the exciting things that we can continue to, to learn and um, discover new approaches over time. And then perhaps another way that um, this might have been phrased is for the models that you develop yourself, like um, whether those need to be updated over time. And um, that's absolutely yes as well. So as these models are developed and put in production, um, we also want to monitor the model performance. Um, we track things like feedback loops from the business and how they're being used. Um, but yeah, these are things that we'll put into a dashboard to see, you know, we want to make sure that the model continues to be useful and accurate um, as it's being used in the wild. And, you know, the business will evolve over the time. So we will um, 
retrain at various periods and check for model drift and um, you know tweak our our parameter tuning and um, other things of that sort as we go as well. Okay, and then um, another question here is, thanks to this talk as a new graduate data scientist, what are your best tips for networking? Yeah, so that's a, a great question as well. So Rebecca, I think, put a link in for one of the prior talks that we had about networking in, in general. And it's, you know, of course, it's evolved during the pandemic as well with the more remote environments. Um, there are a number of you know, LinkedIn groups, um, you know, virtual conferences these days as ways to um, stay apprised with what's out there. A lot of medium blogs on this topic as well. Um, as far as the networking, I think through the the LinkedIn groups, that's been a helpful way to, you know, just directly connect with or follow people that are, you know, doing interesting things in the, a space that you're interested in. Um, you know, I think just being able to to reach out to folks if you, you know, if you're interested in things that they're they're blogging about or um, speaking about. Some of the events have developed um, more of um, kind of interactive spaces where you can kind of have smaller group breakouts. Um, I think throughout your workplace, there's still a number of of spaces where, you know, one thing I mentioned in the talk is that I think that although we have fewer of the you know water cooler chats or random run-ins um i think that the the one-on-one -on -one interactions have still continue to be pretty strong and so as you look around your organization if there are people that are doing interesting work or something that's relevant to upcoming projects that you have you know being able to to reach out for a, a virtual coffee chat i think those lead to really deep conversations that have been um, really valuable and continue to be pretty powerful during this time as well so a few ideas there and then yeah, feel free to check out that specific talk as well for general networking approaches. OK, and then hello, Lisa, thanks for that run through. What have you found is the best method and source for updating on new technologies and the next new tech? Um, yeah, great question there. So, you know, I think as far as the the data science learning opportunities out there, um, it, there are a variety of different types of learning modalities. Um, often it can depend on just your schedule, your what learning format you prefer. So there are some um, great sites through, you know, there's the, the Microsoft platform with LinkedIn Learning um, and the documentation that's available there, um, as well as Microsoft Learn. Um, there's there's third party sites such as um, Coursera and Data Camp, which have um, a number of data science specific topics as well. So those are kind of what I would say bite size opportunities where you can just opt in for a few hours to engage on a particular topic. Um, I mentioned the, the blogs as well are a useful resource for that. Um, the reactor talks, I've seen a number of data science topics coming through here as well. And then there's, um, you know, deeper, certification programs. Um, so there is, for example, a Microsoft Data Science certification, and there's other um, MOOCs, um, massive online courses that you can go through in that construct as well. And so that can be another intermediate format for you know more of a structured learning curriculum approach um, that you could you can track along and follow, but perhaps still do on your own schedule. And then, of course, you know, just depending on the depth and how far you want it to go, um, you know, going through, uh, you know, a, a university program, um, a number of these are offered online as well, such as a, a master's or um, certificate in data science, business analytics um, is a great option too. And so I think as you're exploring those different options, sometimes I recommend, you know, to try some of the online courses and then, you know, see how that works with your schedule, how you're liking the format, um, and then you can move into the, the you know, multi-year program. Um, a few of those multi-year programs actually start with um, a couple of the more generally available online courses, and so that's even a nice way to try that out initially as well. 
Okay, and then another question here. Um, Lisa, thanks for the great presentation. In your use engineering standard slides, you mentioned data contract. Use both upstream for data set owners and downstream for production ops uptime. Would data contract with data set owners be like an XML schema? And could you elaborate on the production ops? What is the line between ML ops and DevOps? Um, yeah, that's a great, great question as well. So, yeah, as far as um, you know, I think you're getting at, you know, how can we how can we automate um, this type of contract? And yeah, absolutely. So that's where a lot of the um, anomaly detection and monitoring comes into play as well. So essentially we want to be able to detect um, any type of outage, you know, before we see that coming through in the, the model or um, data set outputs and before the business stakeholder um, is at stake as well. So um, that is the approach in terms of the the line between ml ops and and devops um and i guess perhaps i'll touch on just you know even the responsibilities within the organization i think that you know while i mentioned that uh we've been fortunate to be in a place where we can specialize with that data platform role increasingly you know thinking with that ml ops mindset and also um doing that work has become something that is broader across the organization that the the machine learning scientists are very much involved in as well and so on the one hand that's a a great way so that the data platform team is not a bottleneck and that we're all think you know developing the models with that mindset involved um but it, it does mean that you know that work becomes distributed across the different roles so another question here, how important is data privacy in data science? How to overcome the limitations brought about in private and secure enterprise models? Um, as far as the question, how important is it? Um, I would say it's paramount, um, it's critical. I think that, you know, we're just, we're in an age where trust is so um, fundamental, so, you know, it's something that you build up over time, but can can lose in an, in a moment. And so, that's you know, I think before any features or insights can be developed, this needs to be you know always considered first. And so that comes into play in terms of you know how we store the data um, with things like um, personal identifiable information being stored um, separately and having you know restricted access only to a smaller subset that need to know um, it gets involved it, it also comes into play in terms of having clear communication to users and opt-in opt-out um, and ability to delete records um, for the users and I, I find that that's you know doing that in a way that's understandable and accessible because it's, sometimes it's technically there but you know is it available to the users in a way they can fully understand the goal is for each user to be you know fully understand how their data is being used and to be you know um, supportive of that that you know they they would like to provide that data because they they um, are appreciating the more personalized experience for example that they get um, and so yeah this is something that we do train our entire team on because you know wherever you are in the cycle um, it's important to have that foundation and context um, of course with GDPR um, over recent years that's also brought additional specific requirements in terms of how we approach the space as well. So um, those are a number of aspects to follow there. All right, and so let me just tune back through the question list to see if there's um, anything, any others that we haven't hit on yet and feel free to continue adding in questions on your mind um, as we have a few more minutes here. Hey, Lisa, hey, Lisa. It's, Rebecca. it's Rebecca. I dropped so much stuff into the chat, so I'm sorry. I kind of overwhelmed where the questions fall in. There was one, I think, a little bit further up by Brandon. What's the best place to begin building a custom database using VSC and Azure? They said that they just started looking at cloud tooling. I don't 
don't know if you had the opportunity to respond to that one. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, as far as, um, you know, the, the data platform approach, there are, um, you know, a number of ways that you can actually leverage Azure um, for your data platform um, through Azure Data Warehouse, um, Cosmos DB, Data Lake. So, um, yeah, I think we've we found that, you know, using Azure to build Azure um, being a valuable approach. Um, so um, a number of techniques you can leverage there. There's also the um, Azure machine learning tools or another asset that I would just recommend within that that overall category. Um, great, and then I see another question that's come in here. You mentioned that there are different learning modalities. I've previously taken a semester of data science and I'm planning on taking a data science boot camp, but it looks like a lot of companies prefer to hire people with a data science major instead. Is it possible to land a job in this field with just online learning or boot camps? Um, yes, I would say it's it's definitely possible. Um, you know, I think there's going to be a variety of different requirements for different roles. So, you know, you'll often see that on the job description, some of them prefer a, a PhD for, you know, like a, a research science role um, for, you know, there might be a variety of different related requirements um, for a data science role. But I think the key is, you know, to be able to show or demonstrate your experience and um, both proficiency in the methods and techniques, as well as ability to pl apply those in real world settings. And so, you know, there are a number of cases where, you know, folks have learned on the job. Um, and so they might not have the, you know, we'll often mention, you know, a background in a quantitative field, um, but it might not specifically be in data science, but then perhaps they've actually you know, had various data science projects on the job because, again, many of these degrees, um, you know, weren't available, um, you know, 15 years ago. And so I think, you know, obviously there's opportunities for that continued learning, as we mentioned, um, as you go through your career, but whether that's through a, um, a formal data science major or degree or through, you know, leveraging these the boot camps or online courses and then being able to demonstrate specific projects that you apply them to. Um, I think I think um, they can be equivalent in that way as well um, and interchangeable. Um, another approach that you can take um, beyond the, you know, the degree is, um, for example, building up a GitHub repository of your projects and that can be a way to, to demonstrate that application of the techniques. OK, I think that was everything thus far. Um, if you want to give it a couple more minutes to see if any other questions come in, I can share my slide and just quickly do a little call to action of joining the reactor. Sounds great. Well, thank you everybody for joining today. Um, feel free to drop me a note if you have any other questions that arise. Um, otherwise, best of luck with your data science journeys. And yeah, look forward to hearing what you all are up to as well. Thank you. And thank you so much, Lisa. So just as we give it a couple more minutes to see if there's any other questions that come in, um, please note that we have lots of different areas that you can follow us. We have a website, microsoftreactor.com, where you can search by region and see events that work with your time zone or you know, personal timing of life. If you happen to be a night person or an early morning, maybe some things in your direct region um, might be out of bounds, but places overseas where some of our other reactor programs exist, you may be able to find. We have 12 physical locations, uh, and right now most of our sessions are virtual, so you have the opportunity to tune into all of them or some of them as long as it works for you. We also have a newsletter we started up a couple months back, aka.ms slash reactor email sign up. We send one bulk 
email um, at the start of each month that just highlights the following month's sessions that we already have on the calendar based on your time zone. So if you just want to have one email to look at and don't want to have to be sorting through calendars, you can certainly sign up to that. Again, aka.ms slash reactor email sign up. Um, again, I posted in the session um, our link to YouTube. We generally record almost, I'd say, 90% of the content we put out, and all of those recordings end up on the Reactor channel. So do tune in there. I dropped in the chat a few links to Lisa's previous sessions. They are as thoughtful and well put together as this session was. Really helpful information. I thought they were great. So if you're looking for additional content done by Lisa, tune in for those. And then what else? And if you happen to be a part of Meetup or not yet, I recommend it. Meetup.com has lots of developer data science events happening routinely all over the place. And again, while we live in this virtual world at the moment, there's lots of sessions and opportunities to both network and continue learning. So definitely check out Meetup.com. Join our reactor if you don't belong to it already and certainly search for other meetup groups that cover those areas. Um, yeah, and then at this time, let me just take a quick peek. Um, yeah, thanks, Rebecca. We did get one other question about Kaggle. Um, thank you so much for pointing that out. That's an excellent resource. Um, there's data sets, there's articles, there are um, datathons, hackathons that you can join. So that's a, a great community as well. Awesome. So yep, yeah, that is at this time. Once again, thank you so much, Lisa. This was fantastic. Thank you all for tuning in. For those that weren't able to stay for the entirety of the presentation or joined us late, again, this is recorded and you can tune in um, and circle back to anything missed at a later date. At this time, I will end this session. Thank you all. Take care and see you at the next one. Bye, thanks everybody. Have a great day or evening, wherever you're joining from. Bye all.